Christ. Can you guys sit right here? Thank you guys. Round of applause for this band. Come on. Ali. Uh oh. I think I'm getting replaced. My days are short. On this. <laughs> My days are short. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited to preach. You know, I, uh, I, love, I love preaching. But it's not because I'm not excited to preach because uh, I'm good at it. No, I'm excited to preach. <laughs> I'm excited to preach because, I, I don't know, every time I prepare for a preaching, like God speaks to me so deeply, right? And so powerfully every time I prepare for it. I'm, and, and what he does for me, it's like, it's like I, I prepare it to give it in a service, but he's actually ministering to me through this preaching. So I'm so excited. You excited? Yeah. Look at somebody say, I'm excited. Yeah. Smack somebody in the, across the head say, I'm excited. <laughs> Some of you said, you, you didn't do it, but that's okay. I just want to give a thanks to those guys in the back, the media team, man. Those guys are awesome. Man. I, man. Love you guys. All right. Let's get right to it. Um, you know, tomorrow is Mother's Day. So I prepared this message for Mother's Day. Now, I, when, I said, when I said, how do I prepare a message for Mother's Day? It's really hard for, for Mother's Day. But I, you know what? I did it. And, and God spoke to me through this message for, for Mother's Day. So I started off with this. How to make mothers happy. How do you make a mother or woman happy? How do you make a woman? Making a mother or a woman happy is the simplest thing in the world. You just need to be a friend, a companion, a lover, a brother, a father, a teacher, educator, cook, mechanic, plumber, interior decorator, gynecologist, electrician, psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist, bold, sympathetic, Athletic, affectionate, authentic, chivalrous, intelligent, imaginative, sweet, strong, understanding, creative, tolerant, prudent, ambitious, capable, brave, decisive, reliable, respectful, passionate, and above all, very solvent. Not jealous, but uninterested either. Not uninterested either. Get along with her family, but don't spend more time with them than with her. Give her space, but show her concern for where she's been. Don't forget important dates like birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, and the first kiss. Unfortunately, following these instructions to the letter does not guarantee 100% happiness for her. Because she may feel trapped in a suffocatingly perfect life and leave you for another. God said we must love them, but not try to understand them. Amen, men? Thank you. How to make a man happy. Making a man happy is the simplest thing in the world. You just need... Intimacy and food. That's it. So it's very simple. Very simple. So today we honor the mothers in our life. I don't know if you know the history of Mother's Day. But I'm going to go for it. The first official Mother's Day happened. There he comes. Is it too loud? Am I being too loud? The first official Mother's Day happened about 103 years ago. A woman by the name of Anna Garbus led an effort to have the first Mother's Day celebration service at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Grafton, West Virginia. Because of this service 103 years ago, it became a presidential proclamation in America that mothers would be celebrated. And it didn't just happen in America, but she started a worldwide movement. And today Mother's Day is celebrated everywhere. Everywhere. Interesting fact, Anna Garbus was never married. And was never a mother. But her own mother impacted her so much that she wanted to honor her. So that's why she created Mother's Day. Mother's Day is the third largest card day in the United States. The third largest card day in the United States. 139 million cards will be given to mothers tomorrow. Mother's Day is the second largest gift giving day. Surpassed only by Christmas. Mother's Day is the second most celebrated holiday in the world. Christmas is first. So it's Jesus, then your mama. You know where Father's Day 
is on that list? Number 20. I can't think of 18 other holidays. Halloween is number six. So ghosts and goblins go before fathers. Anyway, it's about Mother's Day today. Not going to make it about Father's Day. We'll have our day, guys. We'll have our day. So I, want all, I would like for all the mothers to stand up in this place if you're here. All the mothers. Any mother that's here. Let's, let's round of applause for all these beautiful mothers. We celebrate you. Yes, we celebrate you. I honor my wife today. I have my wife tomorrow because she's a mother. She's an amazing mother. I've seen her be an amazing mother. And I've seen witness with my own eyes. Uh, I honor my mother as well. My mother, I mean, come on, really? I, uh, tough crowd. I honor my wife because the things I've seen her as a mother is impressive. I, I've, I've seen her raise her kids, and, and it's a very impressive. I honor, her, I, honor her, I honor her this weekend. So let's go into it. John 16, 16 through 22. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while... You will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. Let me give you some context today. This anal an an analogy is part of Jesus' reassert a reassert assurance to his closest disciples, his closest friends. This statement is being made near the end of his teaching in the Last Supper. Soon Jesus will be arrested and crucified. Though he will be resurrected, the days in between are going to be very difficult for these disciples. In addition, Jesus has warned them, and by extension, all future believers, which are us, about the persecution to be expected from the unbelieving world. His reason for the warning is so they don't respond to those events in panic or surprise. Jesus is preparing the disciples for the overwhelming sorrow that they were about to face and experience in the next few hours as they watched him being arrested, mocked, scourged, and crucified. Their world would come crashing down around them. They had put their hopes and staked their futures on their belief that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Imagine Jesus comes. They were expecting and waiting for Jesus their entire lives. And all of a sudden, oh, I got I to gotta be, be out. I'm dying or so they go, they go, they get confused and they get crazy and they get worried. The previous Sunday, their hopes were high because Jesus rode into Jerusalem and everybody was screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were like, oh man, this is our man. This is, this is the man. And they were celebrating Jesus. Imagine a week later. But now everything that they had hoped for would come to a sudden shocking end. They watched their Lord suffer. They watched the Lord suffer and die. Jesus prepares them, and he prepares us for suffering. Jesus says in verse 16, a little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. This caused confusion among the disciples and the scholars of today. Because this is confusing. So I did some research. There's three possibilities on this. Possibility number one, the first little while refers to Jesus' crucifixion. Whereas a second little while refers to his resurrection. Here's my second possibility. The first little while refers to Jesus' ascension. And the second little while refers to Jesus' his return. And here's a third possibility, which is the one that I like the most. The first little while refers to Jesus' ascension. And the second little while refers to the Holy Spirit coming. So listen to me and hear me out. We're going to talk about this in a little while. When Jesus was crucified, the disciples would weep and lament... And his enemies would rejoice. We all know this. The enemies are just celebrating that Jesus was crucified. But after the disciples saw the risen Lord, their sorrow would be turned to lasting joy. 
Let's go to the verse of the day. The verse of the day is number 21. Verse 21 says, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born to the world. Takes me to mothers right away. Immediately. The analogy Christ uses here is that of a woman in childbirth. Ah, childbirth. I remember it as if it were yesterday. I remember coming out and the world waiting for me. I remember when I opened up those blue eyes of mine and the doctor saw me for the first time. I remember. No, I don't remember. I don't remember anything from my, the, my birth at all. Nothing. And I know my mom was not very happy at that moment. What she was going through. Thank God, and I, I know I speak for men, that I don't have to go through that. Thank God, and I know all men agree with me, that we don't have to go through that. If I wake up in the morning and I stub my toe, I'm out for like 15 minutes. And I'm screaming and I'm complaining. Ask my wife. My wife says, oh, you're such a baby. She tries to fix something and no, it hurts. I'm such a baby. Like all men, we're all babies, man. Mothers, you are incredible human beings. Round of applause for mothers who go through birth for the love of the Lord. That is incredible what mothers go through. Insanely incredible. Like I can't even imagine something coming out of me. It's not like going to the bathroom. It's a little different, right? So, but, and that's even painful for me. Imagine. Of course, Jesus is not suggesting, suggesting that a woman who has given birth literally does not remember what happened. Because women do remember what happened. In fact, it's a cliche. Mothers to remind the children of the pain of labor when the child is behaving bad. I carried you in my belly for nine months. I gave birth to you. Remember what mothers? How many times mother has used that? I've seen that in my own, my own wife with her kids. And men, we stay silent. Because we know. Yo. So one time my wife told one of the kids, I don't know if it was Alan or Adri, I gave birth to you. And I shut up. I go, hmm. I can't compete with that. No man here can compete with birth. Giving birth. The point in the passage is those neg negative experiences are immediately outweighed by the joy of the newborn baby. The birthing experience is intense, agonizing, and even frightening, I've heard. Yet in comparison to the love of a child, birth pain is rel relatively short-lived and more easily set aside. The disciples will soon experience a similar pattern. There will be severe agony, terror, uncertainty. As the unbelieving world murders Christ and scatters his followers. Yet those three days of misery, misery will be followed by a faith so joyous and powerful, it will literally change the world. So, in spite of the birthing pains of sorrow and anguish that you're experiencing right now in your life, hang in there. Don't give up. Because joy is coming. That trial, yes, that trial you're going through. Hasn't come to break you, it's come to make you. Because your time has come. That circumstance that has you worried and stressed out will not destroy you, but make you stronger than ever. Because your time has come. Tell someone, your time has come. Tell somebody next to you, your time has come. Dile a alguien, tiempo ha llegado, dile a alguien. Tell somebody, don't look at me, tell somebody, tell somebody. Tell somebody next to you, your time has come. Oh, tell somebody next to you. Tell somebody next to you, your time has come. 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 They're never going to let me preach again in this place. Watch. <laughs> Their time is, it's okay, it's okay. I need to give this word. Your time has come. Your time is here and it's come. I'm a dangerous preacher. That's a problem. Psalm 35 says, weeping may last for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. You know, I try to get away from this aspect and this thought of suffering in this world. But God keeps on bringing me back. And I, I was pre preparing for this preaching for, for Mother's Day. I go, I got to preach something nice and happy, right? For Mother's Day, so nice and happy. No. And God keeps on bringing me back to suffering. We will suffer. We will suffer. We will suffer. We will go through sorrow. We will go through pain. We are. There's no escaping it. But joy comes in the morning. 
but joy <laughs> at birth. We will have sorrow in this fallen world. Being a Christian doesn't keep us from experiencing deep sorrow. Sorrow can stem from disappointment when something to go, do, doesn't go as we hoped. Like the disciples. Imagine the disciples. It, it doesn't go how they hoped it would. Sorrow can stem from confusion over something in the Bible or in our circumstances. Sorrow can stem from the triumph of evil people. Sorrow can stem from living in the fallen, in this fallen world, this fallen creation. So, let's go back to the little while statement. My favorite. The little while, first little while refers to Jesus' ascension. Whereas the second little while refers to the Holy Spirit coming. A few ver verses before that, John 16, 7 says, Jesus tells his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Who's the helper? The Holy Spirit. Among the many reasons, this is to their advantage. The main one is that the Spirit is going to make the glory of Jesus more real. I'm going to say that again. The Spirit of God is going to make the glory of Jesus more real. Yes, more real than if he were ever there in the flesh. Mm. Does everybody get that for one second right now? Because I got it while I was preparing for it. And it hit me like a, a, a block of bricks, a, 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 a gallon of bricks. The Spirit is going to make the glory of Jesus so real in our life that it will be more powerful and more real than if Jesus was here in the flesh. Powerful. Then verse 13 to 15 says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. This is breathtaking. This is powerful. Do we see that what that means to the disciples and to us? How many Christians today say, if I could only have been there with Jesus face to face. If I could have only seen Jesus how he was in history. Something tangible. I believe sometimes we are as ignorant as the disciples were. We don't realize the advantages we have. We have advantages that God has given us that we don't take advantage of. We don't realize it precisely because Jesus died, rose again, and is not here in bodily form, but he's present by his spirit, the helper, the spirit of truth that the Father sends is the spirit of the risen Christ. John 14, 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He promises that to us. When the Spirit comes, Jesus comes. And this presence, he says, is better than the bodily presence of his earthly days. The reason he sends the comforter, the Holy Spirit, is because we need him for the suffering that we will go through. You see, why do, they, why do you think it's the comforter? Why do you think it's the helper? Why does he send the helper? Why does he send the comforter? Because we're doing good? Because we're perfect? Because we're living in beautiful, beautiful, glorious? No. He sends the comforter. He sends the helper because we will suffer in this world. And we will suffer daily. That's why we take up our cross daily. We die to self daily. Daily Daily suffer, daily suffer, daily suffering, daily sorrow, daily pain, daily. Once we, once we understand it, we can then understand the Holy Spirit and what his job is for us. If we wouldn't be suffering here on earth, then we wouldn't need the comforter. Right? So those people that say, once you accept Jesus into your heart, everything's going to be great, and you're going to live a great life. Heck No. One of the ways the Holy Spirit helps us in these situations is to give us supernatural joy. However, it's important to understand that the divine joy isn't on the same low level as mere happiness. And I want to really focus on this before we end. Happiness is based on circumstantial pleasure, merriment, hilarity, exuberance, excitement, or something that causes one to feel hopeful. Or in high spirits. That's happiness. That's human happiness. 
These fleeting emotions of happiness, although very pleasurable at the moment, usually go just as quickly as they came. Have you noticed that whenever you, something happens in your life and you're happy for that moment, then the next day, then it's gone? So what you have to do, you have to find something else to make you happy? Has that, has that happened to you like we have to live from happiness to happiness because or else we're depressed and we're worried because we need, it's like a, it's like a drug. So we need the happiness of drugs. We need the drug of happiness because it keeps on going away. It's like drug, drug addicts, like druggies really where we want, we want happy. Give me happiness. If not, I'm not going to church today because I don't feel happy, right? Oh, I'm not worshiping because I don't feel happy, right? I don't feel happy. But they just go quickly, they go and they come, they go, come, go. All it takes is one piece of bad news, a sour look from a fellow employee, a harsh word from a spouse, or an electric bill that is larger than what we anticipated. And that emotion of happiness can disappear right before a person's eyes. But joy is unaffected by outward circumstances. In fact, it usually thrives best when times are tough. If it is God's supernatural response to the devil's attacks, the Greek word for joy is kara. The, the Greek word for joy is kara, delivered, de, 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 derived from the word charis, which is the Greek word for grace, God's grace. This is important to note, for it tells us categorically that kara, joy, is produced by charis, the grace of God. This means that joy, kara, isn't a human based happiness that comes and goes. Rather, true joy div is divine in origin, a fruit of the Spirit that is manifested particularly in hard times. Manifested particularly in hard times. Someone may feel happiness, merriment, hilarity, exuberance, excitement, or high spirits, but all of these are fleeting emotions. On the other hand, joy, chara, is a spirit-given expression that flourishes best when times are strenuous, daunting, and tough, the joy of the Holy Spirit. And that's the joy. How many want the joy of the Holy Spirit? I, I need the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that will get us through the sorrow and through the suffering of this world. It is. There's nothing else. I promise you. I've tried to play video games. I've tried to play video games to get out of my depression. I've tried to watch a TV show. I've tried. But the next day I feel the same. No, it doesn't work. I've tried to eat. Eat my way out of the, uh, out of the depression or the sorrow. or the That doesn't work either. It just gets you. Yes. The best way that the lost world has to offer is temporary happiness. You see, what the world is doing to us is that they're distracting us with temporary happiness. So they're showing you temporary happiness. Is, 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 temporary happiness is, is, is to distract us. From the joy of the Holy Spirit. But the supernatural joy, the chara of the Holy Spirit will sustain you even in the hardest times. The joy that follows great sorrow is a heightened feeling of gladness because of the extreme contrast of emotions. It's the joy of the caring shepherd who finds the lost sheep. It's the joy of the woman who finds her lost coin. It's the joy of the father whose lost son has returned home. That's supernatural joy. That's the Holy Spirit joy. That's the joy we need. That's the joy that will carry us through this horrible world that we live in. Let's go back to our main verse now. 21, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. There's more going on this figure of speech than the obvious fact that the joy birth follows the pains of labor. But labor pains, but labor pains don't just precede a child, they produce a child. Labor pains don't precede a child, they produce a child. It's not as tough, there are labor pains, and then it, it's not like, okay, let me see, put it this way. It's not like there's labor pains, and then all of a sudden, a stork flies in through the window and delivers a baby to you. But you go, through the you go through the pains and then a stork flies in and drops the baby in your hands. It's not like that. The baby doesn't just come behind the labor pains. The baby comes by means of the labor pains. 
the pain of Jesus on the cross did not just precede the new rejoicing, it produced the new rejoicing. The divine joy that we have given to us by Jesus through the Holy Spirit comes from sorrow, comes from suffering. Sorrow is turned into joy. And you know what I noticed? Jesus wants us to suffer here so we could learn, so we can learn what the true joy is of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to learn. He wants to teach us. We are so far. He wants to teach us that the suffering that we have here is to, so we can learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. By means of Christ's exalting work, the Spirit fulfills the promise of Jesus that no one will take our joy from us. No one. No one will take your joy from you. No one. Everyone say, no one. Look at somebody and say, no one's going to take your joy away from you. Think of that. The skeptics and scoffers cannot take away your joy. The doctor with the biopsy report cannot take your joy away. Your mother-in-law cannot take your joy. Your strange children cannot take your joy. The political climate cannot take your joy. Global terror cannot take your joy. School shootings cannot take your joy. Racial injustice cannot take your joy. Financial disaster cannot take your joy. Unemployment cannot take your joy. Theological controversies cannot take your joy. Unfulfilled dreams cannot take your joy. Memories of your own failure cannot take your joy. They cannot take, no one can take your joy away. Jesus said, I will rise from the dead. I will verify this by looking you in the face. Then I will go to the Father. Then I will pour out my spirit on you. And until I come again, my spirit will make my glory so real to you that no one will take your joy away from you. Tell someone now, your time has come. 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 Once you remember this, your time has come. I'm done, but your time has come. Praise God.